Welcome to the Online Great Books Podcast, brought to you by OnlineGreatBooks.com, where we talk about the good life, the great books, great conversation, and great ideas. Hello, dear listener, and Happy New Year. I am Brett, the producer of the Online Great Books Podcast, and welcome back. Scott and Carl have returned, and this week and next week, they will be discussing Volume 1, one of three, from Shelby Foote's 1986, The Civil War. This work was very informative to Ken Burns, who made his documentary, I think, in the early 90s. Scott, at one point earlier in the conversation, refers to him as Ken War, and there was nothing I could do to fix that, and he'll always be Ken Baseball to me. So if that creates any confusion, I just wanted to clear that up here at the beginning. Ken Burns' documentary, Civil War. Shelby Foote is a pretty significant voice in that. So if you are interested in the entire box set, which Amazon.com refers to as handsome, the first volume is Fort Sumter to Perrysville, second volume is Fredericksburg to Meridian, and the third volume is Red River all the way up to the end at Appomattox Courthouse. I will warn you, there's a high level of enthusiasm about Shelby Foote's writing in the conversation you're about to hear. And you might be inspired to investigate this for yourself if you haven't done so yet. So before proceeding, you might just want to make sure you can set aside some time. So we will continue with this next week. Thank you so much for your time and attention. And we hope your 2022 is off to a great start. Here we go. I'm Scott Hambrick. I'm Carl Shute. And Happy New Year, everyone. Yeah, Happy New Year. What year is it? 1861? It's always 1861 in my heart. <laughs> hmm. 2022. Yeah, our first seminar was, was in 2018, and that's four years ago. Yep. Yeah, Online Great Books opened enrollment the first time on the 8th of January, 2018. Yeah. And uh, Group 1 is still with us. Seminar 1, which is still going strong. Some of those people, like, didn't they sign up when you just turned the thing on? Yeah. Yeah. And hadn't actually opened it yet? Yeah, I turned on, um, I turned the website on to run my own credit card to make sure that the credit card processing links all worked, and some people signed up. Yeah, and they're reading The City of God right now, uh, St. Augustine. Yeah, I got to finish it and catch up to them. Yeah, somebody in Slack just today said, it would be great if you'd have one of those guys on the podcast to talk about all the benefits. I thought, yeah, that'd be awesome if any of them would be good, you know, host, uh, host or guest. But, you know, <laughs> yeah, that is. I could have all of them on. Oh, my. No, I don't know. I like the all of them idea, actually. Yeah, just invite them all. Yeah. What if we just did one of their seminars? Hmm. Maybe. What are we reading today? Today is Shelby Foote's. The Civil War, A Narrative, Volume 1. Shelby Foote is the handsome fellow with the Van Dyke uh, mustache and beard from Ken War's Civil War documentary. And uh, he's got the wonderful accent. You guys will recognize him from that if you if you saw it. He was a childhood friend and neighbor of our beloved Walker Percy. One of the few humans, I think, Shelby Foote. And uh, he wrote this book that I have enjoyed immensely. Carl, well, what did you think of this? <clears throat> I don't want to say more yet. It's a frustrating book because of the subject matter. The Civil War is... I don't know how many people even think about the Civil War anymore. Not enough. Uh, I know th there's been a mania to... I don't even want to get into current events, but, you know, there's been this mania to get rid of statues of people that nobody even knows who they were. And if they do, they know it from a Wikipedia article, uh, not an Infogalactic article, and say, oh, well, yeah, tear that down. Mm -hmm. And they don't know any of these people. They don't know. <sighs> and they don't know why the statues are there, by the way. So I, I, I do want to talk about this. So. Did you actually finish it all, Carl? I know you were like in a sprint last night to finish it. Did you get to the page? I sprinted last night, but I did finish it, yes, at, at uh, one fifty eight a.m. Yeah, so uh, this book right here takes us from Fort Sumter, Sumter uh, to the end of 1862, which is, what is it, Perryville, I think? 
so we haven't seen Grant on the ascendancy yet in this book. And, you know, there's a lot, there's a lot of war left, you know, but Grant, Grant was a magnanimous fine soul, apparently, as best I can tell. At the end of the war, Mm -hmm. he could have, he, he eventually became president, as you guys know, maybe. And at the end of the war, when he accepted the, the, the surrender from Lee at Appomattox Courthouse and then later became the president, he could have made the people of the South an utterly vanquished and destroyed people. He could have hung Robert E. Lee for treason or sedition or whatever. A, a quote-unquote war crime tribunal could have been held, and you know they could have, they could have killed— Every person who so much as provided a matchstick to the Confederate states, he, he didn't do it. When there was the slave revolt in the Roman Empire that Crassus put down, they crucified slaves up and down the Appian Way. Yep. The rebels, they crucified them up. At that courthouse, he could have said, well, we accept your surrender, now clap him in irons. Yep. They could have taken all those soldiers, of whom an ancestor of mine was there. I was shocked to discover. One of my ancestors was apparently, as far as I can tell, there, because he was in the 59th Alabama Infantry, could have put them in prison for sedition, for insurrection, whatever. He didn't. He said, go home. Harvest your fields. Not only did he do that, <clears throat> which he did, he also allowed them to be proud of who they were. And he let them put up a statue of Robert E. Lee or Jeb Stewart or Nathan Bedford Forrest and wanted them, he m- more than Lincoln, I think, wanted them back in the Union as a people. Lincoln just wanted to preserve the Union. I think Grant wanted him back, and he had a great deal of respect for those people that he liked to couldn't whip. Was was it Forrest who volunteered in a later war? He said, "If you need me," he's just, like I think he sent a note to William Tecumseh Sherman and said, "If you need me, I'm there." Yeah. And Sherman's like, "I'd be proud to have you." There was magnanimity. We've talked about this before. Magnanimity is being big sold. Yeah. yeah, you won. You kicked their. You, they won. The the North won. Uh, It was a bloody fight, and they won. But what do you do to the loser? Yeah, being able to win without vanquishing was really important. Grant knew that, and people have forgotten that. Mm -hmm. I'm rather fond of Grant. Uh, Against my nature, I I don't (laughs) hate him. (laughs) <laughs> but to but to tear those but to tear those statues down is causing an enmity that these people are not aware of. Uh, that war is not over. There, there's a guy. Uh, was it Grossman? Uh, wrote this book on killing. I believe. I believe. That I've read so much. I, I get them mixed up, listeners. Uh, there's this book uh, Dave Grossman wrote called on the psychology of killing. I think that's where I got it. Where he said where he said that the fallout from these wars lasts like 200 years, that the psychological wounds and fallout lasts for hundreds of years. You can imagine that mm. if you were, it doesn't matter, if your father was a combatant in the Civil War and was then either killed or injured or was just gone for four years, that that would have an effect on you as a human and how you would do your child rearing, and then that would then have an effect on their those children. And so on. And of course, there are economic effects and on and on and on. And they go, these things last for decades and maybe even hundreds of years. Foote said that, to bring it back to Foote, that this first volume came out in the 50s. And he thought that this book could not have been written any earlier than it was. That he needed a little time for this to cool off at a little distance so that somebody could see the thing objectively and write something write something useful about it. So this first one came out in 1958. He spent almost 25 years, I think, writing these three big old volumes. That's how much time we will spend on it. So the next 25 years of shows will be on these three <laughs> three books. Yeah. Um, magnanimity. The Nothing that I say will stop what they're doing, but it's a cheap target. You can get rid of a statue and you earn some points with the right people. But 
you earn resentment from people whose histories are being erased. Is it worth it? Well, they think they won, see? They took down the Columbus statue in Chicago. But, um, there was a fight. I, I hate doing current events. I really, really hate it. But I'm going to do it anyway. So there was a statue, I think it was in Grant Park, a statue of Christopher Columbus. <clears throat> that is uh, put there. Well, the, I remember there was a scene. The police were defending it. There was a mob around it. There were police getting hurt. They, were, it, they had a battle. They actually had a battle of Grant Park uh, uh, to defend the statue. And then, you know, a week later, they just come in and take it down. Well, what does it gain you? So you say, oh, Christopher Columbus was a bad guy because of genocide or something. Well, I don't know, maybe. Not in, not intentional genocide, I, I doubt, but it wasn't even on this continent. But why was the statue put there in the first place? The statue was put there in the first place because Italian Americans were being lynched. And so the establishment of Columbus Day and putting statues of Columbus was like, let's find a famous Italian that we can put up to try to uh, incorporate them, I guess us, because a quarter of my, uh, that's a quarter of me, to incorporate them in the American nation. And now you're gonna you're gonna get rid of it. So what are you saying, Italians? You're not members. No, they're evil. The statues are always in a context. It's not just a, it's not an isolated thing. It just bugs me. It, it's it's vandalism. Well, it's not just vandalism, Carl. <sighs> it's they know what it is but we got this damn book here i needed to by the way i needed to have a restorative for this book i don't usually have a beverage but having a little weller yeah me too i called it a comative you called it a restorative that's funny well i've been reading sherlock holmes and Mm. they always like whenever anybody faints or has any medical issue they rush with the brandy that's a good idea (laughs) i think that this book is I think this is one of the great books. I think that four or 500 years from now, people are going to read this book. Number one, it is probably one of the finest topics to write on that could be ever be chosen. Uh, there's so much here. Uh, it was a, this conflict was innovative militarily, technologically, politically, the, the whole event and the, and the characters in the event are astounding people. It, it, it's just the, I, I can't imagine picking a topic that would be more fruitful than this. I, I just don't know what it would be. This war is more interesting than World War I, World War II. It's more interesting than the Revolutionary War, the first Revolutionary War, the United States. Um, I think an important book has to be done about this topic for quote unquote the canon. Like I think this I think this topic has to be treated of. Do you do you agree with that? Uh it should be, yes. I think it's an American Iliad. The that war or this book? Well, the Iliad is the the poem about the war. Right. The war is unique in that it is the cliche is it's brother against brother, but it's the cliche because it's true. There are families where half of them went Union, half of them went Confederate. Uh, there are cases, I think Jeb Stewart, uh, didn't he run around his father-in-law? Yeah. Like his father-in-law, whom he hated, was his opponent, and what, McClellan stole some Confederate guy's girlfriend. Yeah, A.P. Hill wanted to marry this woman, and McClellan was wealthier and was given her hand in marriage by her father. So Hill hated his he hated his guts. <laughs> <laughs> Can you imagine? Doesn't Robert E. Lee have a nephew that's in the North? And his son's one of his artillery uh, NCOs. The stories are just... So it's when you read the Iliad and, you know, all of these people know each other. They're part of the same world. Uh, They visited each other. You know, Paris was visiting Sparta as an honored guest. Uh, It's not invading a foreign power with strange and foreign ways. It's invading your brother, whose ways are just a little different. I think they're way more different than people say. Yeah. Maybe a little bit more different, but it's a unique war. So in the beginning of the Peloponnesian War, Thucydides talks about why he's writing the book. 
And he says, because it is a great war, it is the greatest that's ever been, it's bigger than the Iliad, and the combatants are interestingly different. He doesn't use the word interestingly, but, you know, Sparta, the great land power, Athens, the great sea power. That's why he's going to write it. You could say the same thing about the North and the South. Just as a student of history, this is a good topic. Whether you have family ties uh, to this event, which you might, if you're an American, you might, you probably do. Just dig on 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 ancestry or something, and uh, you probably do. The topic itself is worth reading about. We got to the end. I'm I'm reading about Sharpsburg and Antietam, you might call it, mm-hmm. where uh, the Confederates are like one fourth, one fifth of the Union numbers, and they managed to hold the line and. You don't have to be a Confederate sympathizer to say, oh my gosh, what sorts of people these were. There's a union guy who said, he says, I saw them walking by. He saw them in their, in their, uh, because the Southerners were poor, dirt poor, had nothing. And he saw these scarecrows walking by and he's like, all my enmity went away. He's just seeing these people that have been giving them so much trouble and how little they have. In any war, it seems to me, that which is glorious in the human doesn't know political boundaries. You don't need, you probably shouldn't referee the the people that you're going to admire simply by what side of a line they're on. Uh, There are heroes everywhere on both sides in this war. And so you can you can legitimately admire Robert E. Lee, Ulysses Grant, William Tecumseh Sherman, heck, even McClellan. Yeah, it's okay. I think it should be okay, shouldn't it? Yeah, it it, it is okay. Yeah, I think that the canon needs a book on this conflict, and I think that this is the book because well, who is going to write a better one? Who's going to write a better one? You know, he's when he wrote it. That some he knew some of the people that had fought in it. Yes, his grandfather was one of the officers. He knew these people, and it's written. So it's written by a Mississippian. It is even-handed. Yeah, it is. It's not a. It's not a lost cause, Gloria the South book. No. It's he says there's two geniuses that came out of the Civil War, and that's Nathan Bedford Forrest and Abraham Lincoln. <laughs> Which is crazy, <laughs> but probably right. And then he's a novelist. He had written several novels before he, he took this up. And as a result, he knows how to tell a story. He knows how to develop the character. I think that the topic is needs to be covered for the canon. I think that he is the has the right perspective to cover it in an interesting way. And I think that his narrative approach is an innovation as well, and that could make that could lend to it being an endlessly discussable book for including it in the great books of the Western world, whatever that is. At some point, it's just astounding to me. Yeah, I want to read a sample of the prose. The prose is is perfect. Um, so this is on page four of my edition, which is Vintage Books, a division of Random House. This is describing Jefferson Davis giving his farewell speech in the Senate. Now in January, rising to say farewell, his manner held more of sadness than defiance. For a long moment after he rose, he struck the accustomed preliminary stance of the orators of his day. High stomached, almost sway back, the knuckles of one hand braced against the desk top, the other hand raised behind him with the wrist at the small of his back. He was dressed in neat black broadcloth, cuffless trouser legs crumpling over his boots, the coat full skirted with wide lapels, a satin waistcoat fa- framing the stiff white bosom of his shirt, a black silk handkerchief wound stockwise twice around the upturned collar, and nodded closely at the throat. Close shaven, except I, mean, I could go on. It's just, it, there's a whole lot of wonderful adjectives there. You can see, you feel like you can. you were there. The cheeks were deeply hollowed beneath two high cheekbones and above the wide, determined jaw. His voice was low with the warmth of the deep deep south in it. And then he goes into what Jefferson Davis said. It's it's a pleasure to read all 808 pages of the first volume. The second two are longer. (laughs) I'll get to them. I promise. Yeah. His writing is, is just absolutely wonderful. It's about the damn Civil War. 
but he makes a he puts a cliffhanger on every third page. It, it's amazing to me. Like he he just keeps you turning the pages and keeps you in suspense. It's uh it's an achievement. This this book is wonderful. He talks about uh, Jefferson Davis had been in trouble at West Point. And uh, he had gone to Benny Havens when he was not supposed to have been, which was a bar. I have been to Benny Havens, by the way, which is pretty freaking cool. They moved it, but it's in White Plains outside, right outside the gates at West Point. Charity and I have been there. Anyway, he says, brought before a court-martial for out-of-bounds drinking of spirituous liquors, he made the defense of a strict constructionist. One. Visiting Benny Havens was not officially prohibited in the regulations, and two, malt liquors were not spiritous in the first place. Anyway, he <laughs> frames him as a strict constructionist, you know, <laughs> at West Point as a 19-year-old, you know. That's funny, I think. <laughs> I, it, there's just so much here. I, I, I don't even know. I don't even know what to do. Uh, with it uh, here in the prologue, he talks about the opponents and he describes Jefferson Davis and he describes Lincoln and he just paints such a wonderful picture of, of both of them and uh, the court. Now, I didn't know Davis was married to Zachary Taylor's daughter until she died. Yeah. Holy smoke. He was too sick to go to the funeral. They were confined to separate rooms, each too sick to be told of the other's condition, though Davis managed to make it to the door of his bride's room in time to see her die. She had been a wife for not quite three months. As she died, she sang snatches of fairy bells, a favorite air. She had had it from her mother. Ah, uh, uh. There's a, an empathy in, in Foote's writing for every person in the book. For Davis, for Lincoln, gosh, Lincoln, the... Uh, he goes later in the book, he's describing, uh, the sadness of, of Lincoln. Uh, there's this line where Lincoln says, uh, I wanted to give Tad all the toys that, that I had never had and all the toys that the one that left would have had because mm -hmm. he had a child die in the, in, in the white house, his little boy. And. It takes a a big soul to be able to see in everybody on the sides, all of the sides, their humanity. And this book does it. I, I think it's very great. It's it is very great. He just understands people. Like I want to read every page of it to everyone. Uh the story of the courtship of his set with his second wife is wonderful. Um, She's wearing a, a cameo with a wig device on it, and he's not a wig. And so she's wearing it every day. And then one day she appeared without it, and Davis knew he had won. Yeah. I got that underlined. That's where I was looking. Yeah. yeah. She was a Natchez girl, which meant not only that her background was Federalist, but also that she had led a life of gaiety quite unlike the daily round in the malarial bottoms of Davis Bend. He, he, <laughs> these plantations were malarial bottoms. They they were. Yeah. Uh, yeah, she was a she was a city slicker. I don't even know where to start with it, Carl. It's just too much. I, I can't even imagine writing the damn thing. Um, here on page fifteen, I have underlined here, and it says read. So, in eighteen fifty seven, there were already problems, and we're at the Senate. Yeah. So the South wants the South wants slaveholding to be expanded into the new territories, because if it is not, then they will end up being voted out of the Senate and the House. Which is true. So each time you bring a new state in, you have new representation in the Congress. And so if you're going to bring in Kansas or Missouri or Texas or New Mexico or whatever, and they are free states, uh, this is a political problem for the South. It, and not only that, the South also had designs on Central America and South America. The politicians from the South... Uh, after the Mexican-American War, wanted to just keep on keeping on and take the whole thing, essentially. So Jefferson Davis, he returns to the Senate in 1857. Here, Texas Senator Louis T. Wigfall, a duelist of note, would sneer at his northern colleagues as he told them, the difficulty between you and us gentlemen is that you will not send the right sort of people here. Why will you not send either Christians or gentlemen? 
Here, too, the anti-slavery Massachusetts Senator Charles Sumner had his head broken by Congressman Preston Brooks of South Carolina, who, taking exception to remarks Sumner had made on the floor of the Senate regarding a kinsman, caned him as he sat at his desk. Brooks explains that he attacked him sitting because Sumner, being the larger man, he would have had to shoot him if he had risen, and he did not want to kill him, only maim him. Sumner lay bleeding in the aisles among the gut of percha fragments from the cane, and an enemy stood by and watched him bleed. Southern sympathizers sent Brooks walking sticks by the dozen, recommending their use on other abolitionists, and through the years of Sumner's convalescence, Massachusetts let his desk stand empty as a reproach to Southern hotheads. So if you think rhetoric in the Senate is, is bad now, it was worse then. Uh, they don't beat each other. I wish they did. <laughs> I saw they did that happened in Taiwan, I think. Oh yeah. They had a fight in their chambers. Well, you know, okay, without supporting the actions of Congressman Brooks. It's a pressure release. Okay. It makes it real. Well, so you see the people get up and make their speeches if you are unfortunate enough to watch C SPAN. And they make their speeches and none of them ever convince each other. You can call the vote before the vote is taken. Right. You know where they'll get up and they'll make their speeches. There's never a case where somebody on one side says, you know what? I hadn't thought of that. I'm going to change my mind. Well, if they were beating on each other, which they shouldn't do. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But if they were beating on each other, you, you would know that they believed it. Well, not only that. But they might not go ahead and say or do that other thing because they might get their ass whipped. You know, your old senator so-and-so, he can say or do whatever because there's no consequence at all. Right. One thing that I hadn't realized when I, when I read the book, so Lincoln gets elected. And before he's inaugurated, when was the inauguration? March? It was, I think it was later than yeah. currently. States were seceding, you know, one after the other as he's waiting to be made president. So the, 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 the country that he was elected to be president of, by the time he's president of it, is a different country. That was interesting. I, I mean, yeah. I suppose I knew that was true, but I hadn't really thought about it. Yeah. And uh, there are border states. So this is the middle of 19. The cotton south had gone out solid. The eight northernmost slave states remained loyal. Delaware, Maryland, Virginia, North Carolina, Kentucky, Tennessee, Missouri, Arkansas were banked between the hotheads, north and south, a double buffer. And although Lincoln had not received a single electoral vote from this whole area, he counted on the solid common sense of the people there. So if he loses Kentucky and Missouri... In Tennessee, he's in big trouble. Maryland, they had to force back in because Maryland is north of Washington, D.C., you realize. Delaware, they kept. Virginia, North Carolina, they lost. It's a crazy time. It, it... And there's a point in there that a lot of people miss. Guys, the, the, the way you were taught this at school is so broken and stupid. I, I, it almost defies comment. There were several slave-owning states in the Union. In the North. In the North. Yeah. Yes. Kentucky, Maryland. Virginia gave the North a great deal of trouble. <laughs> and they essentially split the state and annexed the western part of it as a part of all this. You know... It, it's not clean cut. Everybody says it's about slavery. It wasn't. Uh, it was made to be about slavery. It was a part of geopolitical maneuvering on Lincoln's part, it looks like to me. Uh, but there were a great number of slaves in the Union. You know, what's what's the darn thing about? What's what's it about? But Grant's, uh, Grant's in-laws were slave owners, by the way. Right. <laughs> Lincoln is a, a, a creature of fascination for me. I uh, here on twenty seven and twenty eight in the prologue uh, where, where where Foot is laying out uh, sort of backstory for Lincoln. Uh, he he describes how Lincoln 
we'll, we'll, we'll read this. It's on the last paragraph here the, on my page 27, Carl. I hope yours is the same. The paragraph that starts, he believed. I hope that's mm-hmm. the same one. Uh, he's talking about slavery. He says he believed that it was a moral wrong. He had not come to believe that it was a legal wrong, though he believed that too would be clarified in time. The words of his mouth came like meditations from his heart. Slavery is founded in the selfishness of man's nature, opposition to it in his love of justice. These principles are eternal antagonism. And when brought into collision so fiercely as slavery extension brings them, shocks and throes and convulsions must ceaselessly follow. Okay. Fine. Okay. Here's where it gets weird. Repeal the Missouri Compromise. Repeal all compromises. Repeal the Declaration of Independence. Guys, that's not a founding document. Well, keep going. You give him his full quote here. Well, and then he says, repeal all past history. You still cannot repeal human nature. It still will be the abundance of man's heart that slavery extension is wrong, and out of the abundance of his heart, his mouth will continue to speak. Well, I'm not so sure that's true. But that, I, So this is a question. When you read this, you're, like, you're trying to figure out what is Lincoln's conviction? Was he an abolitionist? Was he uh, moved by by this question? And I, Scott is shaking his head, and I'm slightly nodding it. So I've read the Lincoln Douglas debates. If they're from the heart, I, Douglas was a senator from Illinois. He won that election. I guess this is the 1860 election. I've gone to see some of the sites of the Lincoln Douglas debates. They're famous. You can buy a book of them. Uh, the up and down Illinois, there are spots in like Ottawa. You can go and stand in the town square and they would all gather. And I love the format of the debates. I wish we did debates like this. I think you would get an hour to talk. Your opponent would get an hour and a half to talk and then you get a half hour to rebut. So it wasn't this, you know, uh, Senator, what do you think of, of this grave geopolitical issue? You have 30 seconds. There wasn't any of that crap. It was actual debate. But Douglas made the argument that he's saying, if the people of Vermont, these are his words, not mine, if the people of Vermont wish to declare the Negro a person, they are free to do so. But we here in Illinois need not follow their example. In other words, that the rights of humans, rights language, that the rights of humans depend on what the political power says they are. And then Lincoln's response, whether it's from the heart or not, Lincoln's response is no. It, it, he appeals, I can't, I don't have his quote memorized, but he appeals to God, which he wasn't a great believer in at this point, but he appeals to God and absolute moral truth to combat Douglas. Listen. <laughs> Douglas won. Douglas won. I believe that based mostly, not mostly, but based largely on the strength of the Greeley letter, that Lincoln was not an abolitionist. I do think he was abolitionish, but <laughs> but he wasn't. Even- well, the Republican Party was an abolition party. It was a brand new party. You wouldn't join it if you weren't sort of one. Unless you were a, a creature of ambition and could yes. not and could There's not that. get a mainline uh, mainline party recommendation. And, and he was his old legal partner said so that he was a creature of ambition. Everybody thought, everybody knew that about him. And uh, uh, I think he was primarily Machiavellian and abolition-ish. The facts would bear that interpretation. They might also bear mine. Yeah. Uh, Because, you know, there were abolitionists and there were abolitionists. It's like, gosh, in the modern pro-life movement, there's pro-lifers and then there's, you know, pro-lifers. Right. right. There's there's people willing to do things that others are not willing to do. Yeah, he was an abolitionist, but it was not high, high up on his list of priorities, political priorities. I mean, it was, I say high up. I don't know. It's it's not the first one or the second one. It's the fourth one or the fifth one, maybe. Well, and it took him two years to make it an issue anyway. For the first two years of the Civil War, it's not an issue. Right. It's secession. It was a fetishization, by the way, that I wanted to talk to you about of the union. I, in, in, I have read outside of this. I have read other texts about the Civil War and about Lincoln, and I don't understand his fetishization of the union. He says it must be preserved. Why? 
He never makes the case. The man that wrote so much and spoke so well, he doesn't. You know, there are some comments, some little little pieces of rhetoric. The house divided against itself cannot stand, or a nation divided against itself cannot stand. But 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 yeah. like why? We read Lysander Spooner. You know, if you're going to understand Constitution as some sort of contract, it is very strange that you can enter a contract willingly. And then without the Constitution explicitly saying you can't leave, nevertheless, you can't leave. That that seems strange to me. Well, he can declare a war uh, if he wants, but why? <sighs> to preserve the nation, to not give up the, the southern coastal regions, to not give up the cotton harvest. He doesn't make those claims, though. You know, if he said, hey, listen, yeah. you know, I want these agriculture areas. I cannot, I cannot give up. There was some talk about the strategic importance of the port of New Orleans, for sure, but not a lot. If he, there's, I don't see him invoke these arguments about the Monroe Doctrine, how they couldn't tolerate having an, an, another nation on the continent. I, I, I don't see his geopolitical concerns where he would say that if they lost that nation, that there would be a, a security problem with, a, you know, probably actually Britain uh, trying to subvert their actions in North America through this other rival nation on the con on the continent. And even if they had these ge geopolitical concerns, these sort of Monroe doctrine kinds of concerns, it wouldn't preclude him from sending an envoy to Richmond and coming up with a mutual defense treaty and, and treaties that allowed these two countries to exist. But no, he doesn't do that. The union must be, pre be preserved. It is categorically a good. Full stop. That's it. Well, all right. Let me look at page 68. So this is a quote from Lincoln. By the way, I, I want to point out some more of the wonderful footy in prose. La like page 800 or somewhere, he's describing Lincoln's rhetoric. And he says his rhetoric uh, came out with the bark still on it. I saw that. Yeah. It's true. He he's born in Kentucky, lived in Indiana, ended up in Illinois. He's a he's a Westerner. He's rustic, and you can tell it in the way that he and all those stories about his log splitting and all that. You know, like that 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 little phrase that with the bark still on is evocative of that. It's just so much to chew on. Just every sentence is just so toothy. He was a legendary log splitter yeah. at six foot five or whatever he was, and strong monster there there is a popular book which i i confess i read it was silly but it's abraham lincoln vampire hunter <laughs> and you could believe he would have done it uh so this is bottom of 68 for my part i consider the central idea pervading the struggle is necessity that is upon us of proving that popular government is not an absurdity we must settle this question now, whether in a free government, the minority have the right to break up the government whenever they choose. If we fail, it will go far to prove the incapacity of the people to govern themselves. So if, all right, I'll, I can kind of see this. If you have a nation where the when somebody loses an election, they can secede, then you don't have a nation. Okay, fine. Let me ask this, though. Do you, in fact, have a nation in 1861? Did you have a, a nation in 17, was it 1787 when the Constitution is signed? 89. What makes a nation? Uh, uh, well, he I, doesn't use the word nation, but you know, a nation is more than just a geographical convenience. It's a people. Yeah, it was and not one you might one have nation. two different peoples. It was not one nation. You know, the government of the, of the Union was dominated by Virginians really up to about Lincoln. Robert E. Lee is married into the, the Custis family, is, and uh, his wife's middle name was Randolph, and her, was her, was her aunt was Martha Washington, I think it was. Uh, the Randolphs were related to the Jeffersons. You know, the first several presidents, I don't know, out, out of the first 10 presidents, it was probably 60% of them were from Virginia. The South was an enormous political force. Of course, this is the Federalist debate. This is the Federalist debate. Most of the people live in the North. They didn't like it. Yeah, I saw a, a quote from Grant. He said it was, a, it was a good thing. He was speaking after the war. It was a good thing that we did not have a standing army. 
which is also weird to me. They didn't have a standing army. Uh, if they'd had a standing army, most of it would have gone south. And we, he says the north would have lost. Mm-hmm. Which, there you go. There's another reason for the statues. By the way, dear listener, another reason for the statues and the names of all of the forts down there is because in in the wars that the United States fights, the south has provided the bulk of the soldiers even to the present day who knows what the future will bring but they're not if you look at veterans by state there's not a whole lot from new york there's a whole lot from alabama so th- that's the way it is so you can sneer at the the hicks in the south but they're the ones that are in your it's a different culture in your army you were talking about the nation there at the bottom of 68, he says, this issue embraces more than the fate of the United States. It presents to the whole family of men the question of whether a government of the people, by the same people, can or cannot maintain its inter- territorial integrity against its own domestic foes. Well, this, this is bull. One, I do not believe that that country and that this country now is made up of the same people. He says government of the people by the same people. It's not the same people. I'm governed by It's a conflation of government with the people. Yes. Uh, Yeah. But I am definitely governed by some people, and they ain't mine. (laughs) And then he goes on to say, it cannot maintain its territorial integrity against its own domestic foes. Well, if this is a government of the people by the same people, who are the domestic foes he's speaking of? The people that don't want to be part of the government. Right. So what are we really governing those people? Or are you subjugating those people? You know, well, it, it, and, and well, I'll give him the benefit of the doubt. These domestic foes, is he talking about the Indian Wars? Not in this part. I don't think so either. He knew damn good and well that these people wanted nothing to do with him, and a union to him mean, meant subjugating and killing a quarter million to half a million of them if he needed to. Which is what it ended up being. So on 65, we have the quote, uh, they, the Northerners catch a Southerner. What are you fighting for anyhow? His captors asked, looking at him. They were generally puzzled, for he obviously owned no slaves, which most of them didn't, and seemingly could have a little interest in states' rights or even independence. I'm fighting because you're down here, he said. I mean, gosh, it's a, it's a civil war. It's a, it's, it's, it, it's eventually about slavery. It's kind of about slavery at the beginning because that's a motive for secession, but it's also an invasion. It's a hell of a thing is what it is. I think it's a revolution, not a civil war. It's a revolution. It is a different nation afterwards than it was before. Uh, it, before it was a nation where states entered freely. And after it's a, a, uh, a nation where... It's a prison. It's an imperial prison. Well, if you leave, you can't leave. You can't leave. So if, for example, if the state of Hawaii, which actually was a free and independent country at one point, as was Texas, okay, if the state of Hawaii wishes to become the kingdom of Hawaii again and leave the union, well, the precedent is that the Navy is going to show up and say, no, you can't. We settled that in 1865. Once you're in, you're in. It, is this the part of the show? Where so if Puerto Rico becomes a state, then it can never leave. Maybe they ought to think about that. It's a different kind of a thing. It's a momentous event. Whether you think Lincoln was right or wrong to do it, you should understand what it was that he did. You know what I mean? It's momentous. That's all I can say. You tossed something out there that we have to go talk about some more. You said two things in one sentence. It was not a civil war. It was Uh-oh. a revolutionary war. Yeah. Take it piece by piece. The way I've got it, a civil war would be between two factions of the same nation trying to obtain control of that central government of that nation. Mm-hmm. Caesar crossing the Rubicon. Yeah. And fighting Pompey. 
Yes, trying to take control. Caesar versus Pompey is the Civil War. Yeah. Cromwell and the the Roundheads and versus the Cavaliers in England. That's Civil War, I think. Yes? Yeah. Yeah. The king's dead, and now they're fighting it out and trying to figure out who's going to end up control over the whole the whole thing. Uh, that's not what this is. These folks left. Um uh, they seceded. They they didn't try to take D.C. They didn't try to wrest control of the thing away. Um, they just they wanted self-determination, and they tried to leave. That could be a revolutionary mm-hmm. act. The Declaration of Independence signaled just such a, the same intention to King George II. It says, we're out. Yep. It's the exact same thing, I think. Yeah, what does it say in the Declaration? The... Jefferson, a Virginian, wrote that uh, governments obtained their just powers from the consent of the governed. Okay. Well, then, you know, go read your spooner and uh, disavow, abuse yourself of notions of consent. But if you don't consent, then it is right, says that document, which is. It's not a governing document. I think it is kind of a founding document because there was no nation before it and then there kind of is afterwards. So I would, I do consider it a founding document even though it doesn't have governing force. Governing documents, constitution. I think it's influential. But... Well, Lincoln puts great stake on it. He does. But what does he do about that consent of the governed part? He fucking ignores it. Well, or the consent of the governed is he won the election. So if you the winner of the election, that's where consent is expressed. He got like a third of the popular vote and most of the electoral votes because there were two candidates on the other side because they were being dumb. And uh, maybe that's consent. Consent of the governed is whoever wins 51% of the popular vote, I guess. I guess. You know, call it what you want, Abe. Yeah, you know? so... You know, I live in the land of Lincoln. We have all kinds of Lincoln stuff here. I've been in the museums. Um, you may admire him for many of his qualities. Uh, and I don't really care what you think about him. You ought to know the momentous nature of the actions that he did. It's a big deal what he did. It changed It changed the nation forever. If you say, yay, he was right to do it because slavery is bad. Okay. Okay, fine perfectly fine but he did a whole a hell of a lot of enormous things and you should know that they were enormous things yeah he's the father of regime change you know (laughs) no he is listen if you don't like the stuff in the middle east or whatever that's his fault yeah chapter two I don't want to go to chapter two yet. Uh, William Tecumseh Sherman uh, is this crazy, crazy guy, school teacher when the war comes out. Uh, He's eventually going to burn Atlanta. I love his quotes. This is on page 59. He's talking about, you know, war is a terrible thing. You guys don't know what you're talking about because the South is like, yes, let's go to war. It'll be great. You mistake, too, the people of the North. They are peaceable people, but an earnest people, and they will fight, too. They are not going to let this country be destroyed without a mighty effort to save it. Besides, where are your men and appliances of war to contend against them? The North can make a steam engine, locomotive, or railway car. Hardly a yard of cloth or a pair of shoes can you make. You are rushing into war with one of the most powerful, ingeniously mechanical, and determined people on Earth, right at your doors. You are bound to fail. Only in your spirit and determination are you prepared for war. In all else, you are totally unprepared with a bad cause to start with. At first, you will make headway, but your limited resources begin to fail. Shut out from the markets of Europe as you will be. Your cause will begin to wane. If your people will but stop and think, they must see that in the end you will surely fail. And he turned out to be right. Uh, Not a yard of cloth you can make. That's an overstatement. But I love the story about the, what was it, the, the, the... Alabama or the Arkansas, the Arkansas, where they cobble together an iron ship and bust the blockade in the Mississippi. That's an amazing, that's a movie waiting to be made. Yeah. If anyone would dare make it. Now Sherman, Sherman's right. Yeah. Sherman's right. Yeah. It's but, like, you know, if you watch Gone with the Wind, fantastic movie. Uh, and uh, in the beginning, 
what's her name? Scarlet. Scarlet's party. And all these young men are around, fluttering around her and, and uh, talking about how they're going to take it to the Yankees. And Rhett Butler's like, no, you're not. <laughs> I think they knew that. You and I spoke a little bit offline about this just for a moment. I said, well, what, what, what possible path to victory does the South actually have? And, and notice I speak about this in a uh, uh, present term case. And you said just uh, international recognition. And I, I, I think that's right. I've been thinking about that too. What? There's no military victory. Like, how would you come yeah. up with a, a war plan that would bring it? After successfully driving McClellan out of Virginia and wrecking Pope, uh, Robert E. Lee wanted to, that was the time to appeal to Europe for uh, recognition. And if they got recognition from England and France as an independent nation, then they could sue for peace. Then it could have been over. Uh, the master stroke that Lincoln does at that point, he waits, well, he has to wait till after Antietam, he needs a victory, uh, is to deliver the Emancipation Proclamation, which, by the way, doesn't free all the slaves, it only frees the slaves in the South. Yep. So it only frees the slaves that he couldn't actually free because He's they didn't so have. So Machiavellian. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> but, you know, nobody actually reads the thing. It's like people, uh, it's like somebody said about the previous president, people, uh, what do they do? They take him literally when he's not to be taken literally. Well, people didn't take Lincoln literally. They they took him spiritually. So he's made this great act against slavery. And now you couldn't, if you supported the South, you were supporting slavery, which France and England didn't want to do. And so he boxed him in. Uh, I have a possibility. How about this? Yeah. I have one as well. Yep. Let's see if it's what the about same. if the Confederate? What if the Confederates preemptively said, "Fine, we'll get rid, we'll get rid of slavery." Could have worked, maybe. Uh, and just stolen his thunder. You can't let they got they got boxed in so many ways. That, that boxed them in. Uh, getting maneuvered to fighting on to firing on Fort Sumter was stupid. In class, they didn't have to do that. No. no. Um. What was your solutions? Uh, they might have been able to blockade D.C. after Second Manassas. They might have been able to force a, a, If they'd a been surrender. quicker to get to D.C. in the beginning. You have to, dear, dear listener, take a look at a map and see how close Richmond is to Washington, D.C. Washington, D.C. is a southern city. Lincoln would stand on the balcony at the White House and see the Confederate campfires. Yeah. They're right next to each other. And, and yeah. if the Confederates had been quicker, nobody was ready for this war. They didn't have armies. If they had been quicker, they could have swooped in. There's a cliffhanger on every third page of this book. Uh, after After he gets elected, he takes this long train journey to D.C. Like There was an opportunity to have interdicted the train, killed Lincoln. Like, Forrest and Stewart could have fixed this. <laughs> Maybe. No, I, I'm serious. Like, some some a, a rapid, decisive guerrilla action in conjunction with yeah. maybe giving up, you know, say, okay, we just freed the slaves. We sent them all north of the Nason Dixon line. Best of luck to all y'all. Uh, we've got Lincoln. We blew up the train, and so on and so on. We're also keep taking D.C., because it's in our backyard, you all can move your capital to Philadelphia or wherever you want to. Best of luck. That might have fixed it, but they would have, they had about four days to do it. Who knows? Mm -hmm. And they didn't know what they could do. They didn't know that Nathan Bedford Forrest was Nathan Bedford Forrest. No. He didn't know that he was himself. That guy. Uh, was it at that battle where he, he led the cavalry charge and... Uh, Nobody followed him, and he gets shot point blank by a Union guy, and he keeps riding. He grabs. I think he might have grabbed that guy, and he like holds him up on his horse as it was Stewart. Yeah. Uh, it, it, now this is Forrest, I think, in order to hide behind the the the, the Union guy, and he rides out and throws him down. You see, for a he's shield. got a bullet near his spine. There is heroism all over the place. Yeah. A. P. Hill. Oh, uh, Johnston. Oh. <laughs> 
Jackson. Oh God. Uh you ended up being a fan of McClellan. Yeah. Which I yeah. thought was interesting. Yeah, McClellan gets the gets the bad rap as being a man of inaction and being someone who was constantly in preparation and never had enough material or enough men to act. And Lincoln says that, you know, Grant, I can't spare the man. He fights, you know, and uh, he McClellan didn't. But Lee said after the war that he had he had uh, admired McClellan the most. Um, mm-hmm. I think McClellan. Now, McClellan was right for the wrong reasons, but I think he was right. I don't think the North had to fight this damn war. All those things Sherman said about the industrial capability of the South was true. Like, what was the South going to do? Starve to death. Just blockade them. Keep them out of D.C. Uh, fight a small incursion action whenever you can. Keep pressure on Richmond so that they the, the Southerners deplete their, their uh, few resources that they have. And and just let it grind out. You don't have to kill a half a million people. Just grind them out. They had the whole, they had virtually every, they had all the deep water seaports and all the Gulf ports closed down within just a matter mm-hmm. of months. Uh, DC. Well, they would have had safe. to take the Mississippi. Well, but. I think and, they probably would have had. To. And they did it within six or eight months. Butler's there real early. You know, McClellan, I think there was no need to go to Atlanta and burn it. I think McClellan – now, McClellan was a hand-wringing, worrisome uh, mm-hmm. general who is endlessly wanted to prep. I, I, th- that's that's true. But I think he was right. But that's a really interesting comment by Lee because Lee eventually gets beat by Grant. But he thinks McClellan was better. And he beat McClellan in the peninsula in the seven days. So that that's an interesting comment. If he had continued to have the sort of resources he had during the seven days, would Grant have beat him? No. I mean, this is all right. Hard. And Grant spent a whole lot. Of, well, and Grant is a fighter, and this is in probably book three of this series. But but Grant spends a whole lot of lives to beat the Army of Virginia. Yeah. Um, which he was willing to do. Which and and Lincoln wanted is to a hell it. of a thing. Lincoln wanted him to spend those northern lives to do that. McClellan didn't think it was necessary. He probably loved his soldiers too much. There's always descriptions of the the relationship between McClellan and his soldiers, which maybe was too close. Yeah. Is you it know, it, it's um I have never been a general, but I imagine. I mean, it's like playing chess and imagining that you you were really close friends with the pawns. How could you play? You wouldn't want to push. You wouldn't want to do King's Pawn to King's Pawn Four. You wouldn't want to do that. There's a good line in '89. More of his writing in Missouri. The secession question had long since passed the political stage. Here, there was bloodshed from the outset, and all through the last half of the opening year, it was touch and go. A series of furious skirmishes, marches, and countermarches by confused commanders, occupations, evacuations, and several full-scale battles. Jesse James studied tactics here, and Mark Twain skedaddled. Yep. By the way, a lot of the Western outlaws that you know were uh, Confederates who were still fighting. Yep. Blowing up trains and stuff after the war. Jesse James among them. That Mark Twain skedaddling is a sore-ass spot for everybody. You don't like that he left Missouri? He... Skedaddle. Went to Connecticut? There's a specific word. He GTFOH'd, and he should have picked a side. He didn't, his foot didn't have to say that. What does skedaddle mean? It's not a word that's normally part of my vocabulary. Uh, he left with a quickness. Left with a quickness. <laughs> yeah, what is that somebody said of McClellan? That, that foot reports he had a case of the slows. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Which is another, gosh, is another part of the delight of this. I was going to say the delight of this war. The war is a horror, but the delight of studying this war 
is you speak the same language as these people and they're literate and they're hilarious. And, and there is a huge amount of material that you can dive into of, uh, like th- what they said about Fremont, General Fremont, uh, well, I guess one of the, one of the Confederate generals says something about him. That kite's got too much tail. Yeah. Because Fremont always had an entourage with him. You just want to store up these little, these little things they say. It's just perfect. Uh, if I were, you, you would hope that you and your enemies could speak so well <laughs> of each other. I've got my thumb right on that paragraph. I was going to read it. I'm going to read it anyway. You've already spoiled it, but I'm doing it. Which page is it? It's on 90, about Fremont. Fremont, he was a great explorer. You know, he had been out there, out way out west, and uh, was a famous man already, and he was made the factotum, whatever, of uh, that Mississippi, the Trans-Mississippi, not Trans-Mississippi, the area west of the Mississippi. And he, his his headquarters was in St. Louis. To protect his privacy from obscure brigadiers like Grant while he worked 18 hours a day in the three-story three story St. Louis mansion which served as headquarters, he had a bodyguard of 300 men, the very best material Kentucky could afford, average height 5 feet 11 and 1 half inches and measuring 40 and a half inches around the breast. Resplendent in feathers and loops of the gold braid locally known as chicken guts, his personal staff included Hungarians and Italians with titles such as Adelaidus to the Chief and names that were hardly pronounceable to a Miss Missouri tongue. Amavik, Mazeris, I don't know, Kalamanuis, I don't know, were three among many. The list ran long, causing one of his Confederate opponents to remark as he read it, there's too much tail to that kite. Whether he would soar or not, Fremont kept his gaze on far horizons, etc. Whether he would soar or not, you know, taking the kite metaphor into the next paragraph, it's chicken guts. This is a, yeah, <laughs> this book's fun. Yeah, you know, you. I don't know if you've you met people like this. Foot was born in 1915, and so you don't encounter him in, in in video until he's an older guy. But you know, there's these. If you're fortunate enough to have older acquaintances who just really treasure the words that they say and they'll just like sit, they'll sit there with their beer and they'll be silent and then they'll say the perfect sentence and then they'll just sit back and be pleased and be quiet again. You know, it's like waiting for the moment. If you're going to speak, you might as well speak well. Yeah. And Foot knows how to do that. It takes some horsepower to do that, though. Yeah, we've already gotten through Sumter. We're through First Manassas. We're uh, Pierre Gustave Touton. Beauregard is the hero. And uh, Wilson, Wilson's Creek is kind of up next. That's not too far from here, Carl. We'll have to go to Wilson's Creek this summer. And also Elkhorn Tavern. Yeah. Ridge. Which is also another general comment. I mean, there's no way we're going to go through all the details of the first two years of the war as we talk about this. We're already an hour and 10 minutes in and, um, you know, you got to go read it. So I, what I would hope you would get, one of the things I would hope you get out of the podcast is go read it. Okay. It's, you should know something about this and this is the best book to do it with. Yeah, it's the best. You got, guys, you've got to go read it. I mean, if it takes you... Uh, hell, it's going to take me three or four years to read all three of these, uh, amongst all the other things I've got to read. But you, you, I've got you've got to do it. Yeah. So as I drive, uh, I've been driving um, into the Midwest, into the south of the Midwest, quite a bit recently. You know, if as you drive through this country, you can tend to think that there's nothing really there. You get on your on ramp, you get on the interstate, you drive for nine or ten hours, and then you get off the interstate. And you can completely miss the country that's in between. Well, reading an account of the wars that happened in the land where you live makes you see things like rivers and plains and mountains a whole lot differently. The landscape can come alive to you. At least it does for me. As I'm driving, I'm thinking, you know, I'm thinking battle plans. You know, where would I put my troops? Where would I put my artillery? Mm. Um, Stuff that doesn't matter to us currently in our mechanized age. Uh, you can recover some of that by reading this stuff. Yeah. Heck, there were battles around Springfield, Missouri. Springfield, which I don't even... It's Wilson's Creek's out there, yeah. 
I'm telling you, yeah. we gotta go. We gotta go to Pea Ridge. That's not very far. We can go there this summer. That's where that Elkhorn Tavern in Van Dorn. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Haven't been there a long yeah, time. Yeah, my grandfather used to take his kid. They went to Civil War battlefields every summer. Sounds uh, awesome. It was one of his avocations. Sounds awesome. Yeah, I, I had uh, vivid, vivid dreams after reading this. Every evening, I'd read and then put it down and go to bed, you know. And then uh, I'd fight them all night. It's astounding. Astounding book. Astounding. The whole, the whole damn thing. I don't know if people are up to it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, I kind of want to dig out things that are, are interesting and without being systematic about it. The character of Ulysses Grant, Hiram Ulysses Grant, is very interesting to me. You know, there's the, the legends of him drinking too much, which are probably true. There's this quote from Sherman, I stood by him when he was drunk, he stood by me when I was crazy, which was probably true. I've been in his house in Galena. I've read probably half of the first volume of his memoir. He has four volume memoirs, which are excellent, so much so that people suspect that they were ghost written by Mark Twain, but he I don't think them. they were. I've read them all. He wrote them. But, you know, the image of him sitting, dying of cancer, sitting on his porch in New York somewhere, writing these to try to provide for his kids. The guy was a failure everywhere ex until the war happened. He was a shopkeeper in Galena and failing at that. And uh, this, he'd been a hero in, or, or served with distinction in the Mexican-American War, you know, with all the rest of these people. They all knew each other. Uh, Lee was in that war as well. I think Jefferson Davis was in that war. Everybody was in that war. But he, he finally, he gets, a, uh, he's got a, a slave-owning wife. Things are not as clear-cut. But when he, w he was made a colonel and then a brigadier, and his father says to him, this is on page 197, Be careful, Ulysses, his father wrote when he heard the news of the fluke promotion. You're a general now. It's a good job. Don't lose it. Civil servant, whatever, man. What about these guys and their wives? Some of these guys. Mary Todd Lincoln? Forget it. What a horrible, what a piece of work. Disgusting. Uh, she had some issues, yes. She's nuts. Absolutely nuts. Uh, Fremont's That's what I was wife? Saying. Fre Fremont's wife? Nuts. You know, he wanted to, uh, Lincoln found out, you know, Fremont wasn't doing what he was needing to be needing to get done there in the West. And, um, word got out that maybe there was some fraud going on. There were like $12 million missing in that, in that theater. People, don't, people probably don't know this, but when war breaks out, there are like pallets of money moving around to buy material, people, mm -hmm. whatever you need to do. And there's just $12 million missing. Yes. We, we read about the war profiteers in War is a Racket. Yep. Fremont's wife goes to D.C. to meet with Lincoln and uh, chewed Lincoln out. And he says later, she left in anger, flaunting her handkerchief before my face. Can you imagine? She's just nuts. And she, she does stuff like that frequently. You know, Mary Todd Lincoln's a monster. Not everybody can have Jeff Davis's wife. He seems to be. A splendid creature. Yeah, I, uh, Fremont's wife and uh, Grant's wife to a lesser degree. And, and Lincoln, it's like, good Lord. Yeah, well, McClellan's always justifying himself to his wife. Yeah. Writing letters. And they don't appreciate me. He writes letters to her every day. Yeah. But, but one of my favorites, Stonewall, um, he likes to lay prone on Sundays and won't even write his letter, wife a letter. Like he keeps the Sabbath unless there are Northerners to destroy. I was shocked to discover how young he was. Stonewall? He only made it to 39. I'm an old man compared to him. He seems much older. Yeah. Old blue-eyed. The telling of the Shenandoah Valley campaign in Jackson uh, in, in this thing was just, I, I was just on the edge of my seat. I was just hyperventilating for like 50 pages. And I went and to you bed. know how it turned out. Yeah. But then I went to bed and I dreamed about it all night. Jackson was just a giant of a man. He, 
Like what, what happened to him in the seven days campaign? What the fuck was going on? Did he just have like a psychotic break or something? God was talking to him. So I don't know to the listener. It keeps recurring the line. And where was Stonewall Jackson? Jackson had distinguished himself at, at Bull Run, first Manassas. See the North, they didn't, they were not in their land. So they would call things by landmarks, but the Southerners would call them by their, the town names. So you end up with Sharpsburg or Antietam. The Southerners call it Sharpsburg and the Northerners call it Antietam after the river. Bull Run, the river, or Manassas, uh, if you're the Southerners. Yeah, uh, Foot tends to use the Southern names for these battles. But in the, he distinguished himself at First Manassas or First Bull Run, Jackson did. Later on, he gets not, he's not just a brigadier. Now he has the Army of the Shenandoah. And uh, these men are so fast on foot that they call them the foot cavalry. His men would cover enormous amounts of territory, and com- and he could completely disappear. He would have twenty five thousand men just disappear. The North couldn't find him, and he would fight, he would uh, in, through that Shen- Shenandoah Valley campaign, just did the impossible for for five days. It, it's, it's astounding to read. So. When the Seven Days campaign starts, which is really perilous, where the where McClellan threatens the Southern capital of Richmond, Jackson and his foot cavalry is dependent on to uh, secure this sort of northwest flank, or to come up on this northwest flank of the the Northern Army, and he never does it. Like there, Foot tells stories of him just like napping under trees. Mm-hmm. He he's just he's lethargic and he just doesn't do it. Uh, sometimes I got the impression from what I was reading that Foot was implying that he thought that the orders might not have been very good or that the uh, the it wasn't. Maybe he didn't agree. Maybe and then sometimes I thought it was just pure exhaustion because he had you know there were there, there were tales of him riding like 14 hours straight to come speak with Lee and then hopping on a horse and riding another 14 hours to go back to his men. So he'd be in the saddle for literally Mm -hmm. 28 to 30 hours straight, you know? So was he just broken from fatigue or all those things? I don't know. But again, and over and over again, it's like, where is Jackson? Where is Jackson? Well, and he would never tell anybody his plans either, which you just be, nobody would know. Which, you know, was probably a good idea (laughs) because as you find out in this book at Antietam, uh, Antietam was supposed to be, Lee was attempting to invade Maryland and it it was an attempt to force peace. Uh, They they tried it again at Gettysburg. Uh, If you could get into the North, you could get them to back off and just leave you be. And so it was an invasion attempt, which Bragg did in the West into Kentucky. But the order that he gave telling where all the armies was going to be was wrapped around a cigar by one of his people and left in a field where Union people found it. And so McClellan knew exactly where he was. And so he couldn't do his invasion plan. They managed not to get crushed at Antietam. And uh, it was an intelligence failure. Yeah. We have to tell that story better or more. Lee devises at Antietam or Sharpsburg to divide his divide his force three ways, I think, and do this com- very complex sort of encirclement. And the thing's brilliant but scary, you know. Uh, and he wrote out several plan or copies of his plan. He brought in his lieutenants gave them copies of it, went over it um, in detail with each of the men one at a time. One of the generals then memorized it, tore the plans up, and ate them. That's good OPSEC. Meanwhile, another one of these cats copies them onto another piece of paper because he may be asked to destroy the original, right? So meanwhile... 
while Lee is going over these plants with these other guys and he's waiting, he copies them, wraps three cigars in and puts it in his breast pocket and he goes on. Later on, he loses the cigars. Some scrounchy northerner picks up this bundle of cigars, sees this paper, (laughs) and then takes it in. And now McClellan knows his order of battle. Jeb Stewart, God bless him, was found by a Southern sympathizer who let Stewart know that McClellan had Lee's plans. Stewart returned to Lee and let him know what was going on. And through that and a thousand other graces, we're able to turn that into a, (sighs) I'm not sure what it is. It's not a victory, but it's not a loss either. I think both sides, both sides from time to time to time call Antietam or Sharpsburg their own victory, but it's not sure. Um, Uh, A bloody a bloody day where lots of people died and a lot of people nothing died. was really decided. Yeah, kind of a thing in modern war. You can see pictures from Antietam. Uh, Matthew Brady was there. You can see pictures of these uh, young men dead in the field, which is another thing about the Civil War. You know, if you read about the Revolutionary War, there's no pictures. But, you know, I can go see that that poor guy that died. Uh, so there's a Confederate soldier after being wounded, evidently dragged himself to a little ravine on the hillside where he died. I guess Alexander Gardner took that picture. Uh, but yeah, you can see it. It's a very knowable war. You can know it. Yeah. Jackson at Antietam is another astounding thing. Stonewall Jackson. It, it just, uh, this tears me up, man. Can't take it. Yeah, so many dead people. Gosh, unbelievable. But my, my union, though, Carl, my union. So you, you go do this, and you kill all these damn people, and you burn all this this stuff, and you just damn near you just take everything to the brink, and now you got a union. But it's a union of what? Like, what is it that you have now? It's different. When uh, Caesar took Gaul and made it a province, that's what it was. A province means a place you have conquered. Yeah. I was surprised to learn that the South also suspended habeas corpus and had conscription before the North did. Mm -hmm. Uh, I did not know that. I like that I like. When I say I like, dear listener, it means I find it fascinating. It doesn't mean that I'm saying hooray. <laughs> but maybe in this case, I like that there are politicians fighting in this thing and getting killed. Mm-hmm. Like Breckenridge had been the vice president and uh, left the Senate and went and joined the Confederacy. Um, there's a, you know, Northern senators, I guess a Senator got killed. One of the Northern senators, but I mean, this is skin in the game. Yep. Which I appreciate rather than, you know, sending other people to die. Uh, of course, I don't know their motives. I mean, some of these people are saying I'm either coming home or here. I'm either going to get glory or be dead because they knew, you know, lots of them had designs on the presidency. And a military career was a way to do it. Uh, so you go serve with distinction in the war. So I, I wonder, a lot of people saw it as an opportunity to climb. But that was a frustrating thing. Reading the, the uh, Confederates, was it, I, I can't remember who it was. I think Longstreet was one of them. Um, maybe it was Longstreet and Hill. But they're both offended at the marching order. There's These games of, of precedence. Yeah, there's a lot of sort of um, genteel chivalric bullshit on the part of the South. They allow these armistices for, and then get treacheries <laughs> committed against them, and they you know get outraged about you know Hill marching out before Longstreet or whatever. You know that that, that bothers me sometimes when I read it. But 
Well, the rivalry between generals bugs me. You know, you figure you're in a war that you're in a war for a desperate reason. It doesn't matter if Grant and Halleck get along or not. It shouldn't matter whether they get along or not. If if the war is worth fighting, they ought to fight it. Right. And not worry about who's going to get more credit. Uh, and you see that on both sides in, in this book. and just Except for Morris Lee. You know, we'd already talked about how sort of ma- magnanimous that Grant ended up being in victory. What about the magnanimity from Lee every day? You know, he mm-hmm. uh, he's just so gracious to his subordinates, uh, never takes credit for anything they do, so considerate of Jefferson Davis. You know, D- Davis Davis was a little bit of a pain in the ass to uh he was a he was a military man himself. Well, Lincoln could micromanage, but I think J- Davis had a D- Davis early on had a inclination to micromanage, had trouble with some of his military help and Lee understood that and he would always sit down and take the time to write him a letter, receive him at the at the field of battle talk to him, keep him in the loop. Just a super kind guy who seemed to care about all, all of the people involved, all of them. You know, and, and later on after this war, you know, he ends up being the president of a university. Arlington National Cemetery is his is his ancestral home. They took it from him. And he ends up being a university president and uh and just beloved. Uh, no Nobody until 2014 had a negative word to say about that man. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yep. If you're going to delete your history, maybe you ought to learn it first. Yeah.